In the last video, I showed you the ceiling that I made for the Beetlejuice waiting room. In this video, I'm going to show you how I made it and dive into explaining some of the complicated lighting that's going to occur over this project. I also plan to add light into the hallway that I built last year. So there's quite a bit to do, but before we get started, I wanted to do one last reminder for getting a Bentley House mini shirt if you were interested. The last day to order is May 15th, and then the shirts will start getting shipped out. Oh, I'm kind of short. Thank you so much to everyone who already put in an order for the shirt. And also thank you for those who have given me feedback. This is the first time I've ever done merch, and so I've learned a lot. So without further ado, let's get started. As you may remember from the previous video, Stormy was helping me quite a bit with this process. I started with a cardboard template I had from originally figuring out the room. I used some post-its on an edge that I needed to extend, I used some masking tape and a small triangle to make sure that it was the right size. Then I transferred the shape onto a piece of foam board. The foam board is going to act as the ceiling tiles. I want the foam to be exposed because that's going to give me a really good texture for the tiles. So I slowly peeled off one side of the foam board. Then I could start laying out my grid. Just like every grid I've created in the Beetlejuice house, it's going to be a little bit wonky. This is also going to help with the forced perspective that I'm going for. I put an X on the shapes that I knew I was going to cut out to create the lights. The lights are just going to be made of LEDs that are sitting above the ceiling. Once these were cut out, I decided to go ahead and cut a thin layer of foam board off the top. This is going to give me a little bit of a lip so that when I inset the acetate or the plastic that I'm going to be using to make the front of the lights, they are going to be flush with the panels. In order to reinforce the foam board where I had cut out the rectangles, I decided to glue some popsicle sticks just to make sure these areas aren't too weak. I'm using some leftover plastic that I had in my collection. This is from some random toys or different games that we got. I just like to keep it and it always comes in handy. I'm going to be drawing out the shape that I need for each piece and then cutting it so it fits inside the edge that I created. In order to make sure that the light is diffused enough, I am going to be sanding both sides of each piece of plastic. I'm sanding up and down, side to side, and in circular motions, so there's plenty of area on the plastic for the light to bounce around. I also wanted to make a grid that was inset on the top of the plastic. To do this, I'm using another piece of acetate. It's much thinner, it's a transparency, and I'm just going to be using my X-Acto knife to barely score the front of it. This is going to get glued on top of the piece I already created, and it's gonna give kind of a gridded look, which will make it look more like that industrial plastic that sits on the top of these types of lights. I felt like there wasn't quite enough diffusing happening with just the sanded plastic, so I'm going to be sandwiching some tissue paper in between both pieces that I created, the sanded piece and the piece that I put the grid into. I'm using Mod Podge to stick the pieces of plastic together, and because I am already making sure that you can't see through it, doesn't matter if the Mod Podge doesn't dry completely clear. I'm doing this for both pieces and letting it dry completely. Once it's dry, I can cut away the tissue paper and I have a very diffused piece of plastic that's going to fit in the light openings. Once that was done, I decided to texture the foam a little bit more. The foam itself is pretty textured and already looks like a ceiling tile. However, I used a pencil to put larger dents all over and then I used this sculpting tool with little bits of wire and this is going to give smaller dents here and there. I'm putting down a base coat of white acrylic paint. This is going to take off the little bit of shine that I get from the foam, and it's gonna make a nice base layer that I can start to build up other colors. Because this is supposed to be a very old ceiling and probably there's been lots of smoking going on in this waiting room, I wanted to make sure and add a wash of this tan brown color over the entire thing. Once I've got it down evenly, I'm gonna go back and allow some of it to kind of pool in different areas. I don't know any tile ceiling, no matter how new it is, that doesn't have a little bit of water damage somewhere. I also decided to do a complete second coat of the watered down paint on some tiles to make it look as though they had been replaced at different times. Now that most of the painting had been finished, I could go ahead and glue in my lights permanently. Each section of plastic is going to be covering two lights, 
and when I make the grid, this will be much more apparent. To start creating the long gray pieces that I need for the grid, I'm using a piece of poster board and I'm painting it gray. Then I can take a long ruler and a sharp craft knife and start cutting off individual pieces that are going to create my grid. I'm not worried about them being too consistent because the grid itself on my ceiling is just kind of wonky. Then I can start laying it out and see how it looks. I did realize about halfway through the process it's going to look better if I make a border around my lights first before I lay the grid on top of it. This is a lot more accurate to how lights that go into ceiling grids are because they are their own entity and they just kind of get set down within the grid. So having this border I think looks a lot nicer. Then I can start adding the grid on top. I did all of the vertical lines that you see in one layer and then I went back and cut individual pieces to go in between so I have lots of little choppy bits for the horizontal pieces. Of course I had to age the grid pieces that were going all over because I had a very aged ceiling, I needed an aged grid. I used some of the black that I used on the grid to get some different tones in the aging and that's how I made a pretty simple and quick grid foam ceiling for my Beetlejuice waiting room and I'm really happy with the results. I think I will be doing this again. I'm going to show you some repeat footage from the last video and that's because I had started to install the ceiling. However, I'm showing that to you again so that everything's contained within one video if you're really just wanting to make a ceiling. You might be able to faintly see the pencil line that's on the back of the wall there and that is one that I drew when I was test fitting my ceiling. As you see here, it fits pretty closely to the line I drew, but this is going to help me put in the first piece that helps me install the ceiling. It's going to be a piece of wood that's going all the way against the back wall. This is going to be easiest by removing all of the furniture, getting it out of the way because I'm going to be dropping and just making all sorts of mess inside the room. I consider this to be the most important part of the installation. This is the piece that my ceiling is going to rest on while I am installing every other part of it. I'm also making sure to check as I go along. If this piece fits well, then hopefully everything else will go in seamlessly. Once I'm happy with this back wall support, then I can go ahead and redraw my side lines. If they're different from my pencil lines, I'm going to be using a different color. When I'm happy with those, I can go ahead and add the supports on the side. My plan for the ceiling is not to glue in these back wall supports, but to only be gluing the front. The idea behind this is if I ever have to get to the lights above the ceiling, all I have to do is undo the front part which is glued and the rest of it will come out easily. From here on out is all new footage to show you how I installed the ceiling permanently and I will also give you a look into how the lights are set up on top of the ceiling. After completing last week's video, I noticed that my ceiling was droopy and I needed some more supports on the side, which kept the foam board exactly in the location I wanted. So I'm using a piece of foam board to mark out the width that the foam board is so I can sandwich it between another piece of wood. This is going to keep it from bowing or anything in the future it's going to stay exactly where I put it. This is even more important because I don't plan to glue the back of the ceiling. Now to fix the droop in the front, this is quite a long run. So what I've decided to do is add a piece of wood. This is also going to give a little bit more room in the ceiling to allow for airflow and for the light to be able to bounce off the top. You may have noticed there are some mirrors underneath the ceiling and you'll see why this works in a little bit. I laser cut a grid that's going to allow some air to flow through the top of the ceiling and I'm going to be installing that within the pieces of wood and all of it's going to be glued together to make a strong piece that will keep my ceiling straight. There's also a little grid on the side. This is over by the area where the turnstile is. This will allow the air to flow over the LEDs. There's a hole at the back of the room where the air can flow through and then out the electrical area. The string of lights for the ceiling get plugged into the back wall and then they run around each interior side of the lights. They will bounce off the mirrors into the holes. Then it goes over to the now serving box which will hang underneath the ceiling. 
Right here behind the grid, I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of light coming through and I really don't want that. So I'm going to be cutting a small piece of black matte board that's going to block the viewer from seeing most of the light, but it's still going to allow the air to flow around it and cool down the LEDs. I'm also going to do that on the other side by the other grid. I'm pre-painting the grid black before we install it, but here you can see a better look at how that piece of matte board is going to be blocking the light from the grid. Before installing, I painted a small line of black just above the ceiling grid in case you can see through it, and I made sure that my plug is coming in from the interior part of the project. Also, you will be able to see how these mirrors are going to be right above the lights. This is going to help the LEDs shine up to the ceiling and then down through the lights. If I have the LEDs right above the lights, you would be able to see the individual nodes and it would look really weird. I also made sure that my now serving sign was hanging down before I started to install it. Again, I'm not putting any glue at the back of the ceiling. It's going to be held in place purely by what I'm going to be doing here at the front. I'm using my dollhouse band-aid method, which is basically just computer paper with a lot of glue on it. It's going to be connecting from just underneath the ceiling grid all the way up over the wood piece that I added and onto the top of the base. This is going to hold it in place permanently. And if I ever need to get to those lights, I can simply cut through this piece of paper right where the wood is and I can get to my lights and fix it. And all I will have to repair is this front edge. I want to make this front piece look like a fur down, which is basically just a small wall that comes down from the ceiling. So I'm adding another piece of the poster board along the edge to make it look like the ceiling grid ends there. And then I am painting just like I did on the back wall with my sand, paint, and glue mixture. And I'm making sure to be careful around the grid. I do want it to look like, well, I guess it could be called a grate. Uh, I do want it to look as though it is inset into the wall. I continued the sandy paint mixture along any other ceiling that was showing, and then I left it all to dry. Since my now serving sign was just kind of hanging off of the ceiling, I've decided to add a tiny magnet behind it to make sure it stays in place. I put some pin nails on the back of the box, and then I made sure to glue the magnet, it's on like this little triangle bit of wood, onto the wall. So now, there you can see it a little bit better, I moved my light for you. Now my now serving sign will hang in place and I don't have to worry about it rattling around or getting turned around somehow. So there are actually three strands of lights that are going into this one space. So I'm gonna try and explain that a little bit. The first strand of lights I didn't really show you, but it is in Miss Argentina's area and the turnstile area. The second is going to be this piece that goes to the lamps, and the third is this one back here where the other end is actually plugged into the ceiling lights. That was the little plug you saw hanging out of the wall. So I do need to put this one into place. I wanted some light behind those back doors because there is supposed to be more office behind there, and because it's such like a loose fitting, those little panels are kind of loose fitting, I knew they'd show some light, and I thought it'd just add some more interest. I don't want them to directly shine on the panels, so I've decided to install it sideways on a piece of wood. Now for this line, this is going directly to the lamps. The lamps are done with dumb lights, which means they don't change color or turn on and off with like a certain timing, but the everything else is smart LEDs. So I have to put the lamps on their own line, and hopefully I will explain that more a little bit later. I decided to pop out one of the panels I made with Warbla, and because it's Warbla, I could use my hot glue gun to carve out a little corner in order for the lamp wires to come through. Now the trick to this is going to be hiding these connectors or plugs as I've been calling them because they're not very in scale. They're really just more useful so I can take the lamps out during transportation. So to do this, I have hollowed out the foam board that's underneath this single chair and I've made a little hole so that the wires can go in. Now this connector is held underneath the chair and it does look like there are lamp wires coming from underneath the chair, which there are. <laughs> which would normally be a tripping hazard, but of course, I think in the underworld, we don't really need to worry about that. So, and once people are in place, I don't really think the wires will be noticeable at all. 
I turned down the lights and I've turned up the ISO on my camera so you can see what I see when I look into the room. This is how it is looking with the completed lights. I am so happy with the effects and I just, I can't wait to see like all the lights dance around with the music. Now you might be noticing there is another area that is quite bright and needs to be tamed. So we're on to that one next. When I finished the hallway in the previous beetle gust, I had left several things undone because I was unsure on how I was going to be doing the lighting. But now that I have a lighting plan, it's time to finish it up. So my general idea for the lights, or the best way to explain this, is you know how at Christmas or Halloween, when you see those really cool houses that have the music going in the background and the lights of the house move with the music and there's like mouths and all that kind of stuff? So I'm wanting something like that. Of course, I would go from basically no lights or battery lights in the Adams Family House all the way to the most complicated lighting system ever. Of course. Hopefully by the end of this, I will have a dollhouse that plays some of the Beetlejuice music and the whole house kind of looks like it's dancing to the music. I think that's really appropriate for the vibe of the entire movie. I'll be honest with you that I'm still learning how all of this works and there are several times as I'm trying to learn, I feel kind of dumb, but I have to remind myself, I know I'm not dumb. I'm just learning something completely new and pretty complicated, so it's going to take some time. This reminds me of my favorite Albert Einstein quote. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Or in my case, everybody is a genius, but if you judge an era by its ability to understand electricity immediately, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Which I know I'm not stupid, it's just going to take some time. I hope to learn more as I go along, and I know many of you are interested in this process as well, so I'm going to try and share in little bits and pieces as I learn with you. So if you really wanted to dive into this whole lighting system, you can kind of learn along with me. So in today's video, I'm just going to share the very basic bones of what I know so far. What you're seeing here are the loose lights that have been put in place and soldered by my husband, who I refer to as Mr. Technology on this channel. He has done all the installation and these panels that you are about to see. I'm going to turn them off before I put the camera over there because they're kind of blinky. I know this looks complicated, but I'm going to give you kind of an overview of what each one of these does. What you see here in red is just the power supply and the plug. This is what's going to run power to both of the panels that are running the light. The panel that you see in the light blue controls the dumb LEDs. So it's just telling lights to be on or off. It's not sending any program information like change colors at certain times. And the purple is a power converter because the dumb LEDs take nine volts instead of five volts like the rest of the lights. The panel you see in green is the Smart LED Pixel Controller. This is what is sending information and power to the lights, telling the lights to be on or to go on and off in a certain pattern or to change colors. So it's basically a little computer. All of these are going to work together to control the entire house. Where you see my flashlight moving around in the center is where all the wires are going to come down from the upper house into the base and go to these panels. Once all the lighting is completely run through the house and the base, we will be putting a closed off section here. So there's basically just buttons you push to start up the entire system and a fan in order to pull all of the heat through the house and out the side so that nothing gets overheated. This is just a summary of what I understand about all of this so far. There are two lines that are going to go into the hallway, line number one and line number two. Line one is really long and line two only has one light on it. Line one comes through here to the sandworm jail. It goes through the wall into the hallway and this is going to be a long strand of LEDs that are going to be glued up behind this front panel so that they're kind of hidden. While we're here, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about what I've learned about these wires. So each set of smart LEDs is going to have three wires. The red wire is the power that's running from the power. It's going to go through all of the lights. The black is the ground. 
which means when the power gets to the end of the lights, it will turn around and come down the ground and it just keeps going in a loop. The white is what's sending the computer program to the lights to tell them what to do. The smart LEDs will have all three of these lines. The dumb LEDs will only have two, which are the power and the ground. We are still continuing down line one, which is going to this light, which is behind the Lost Souls door. If you remember from Beetlejuice, this one is supposed to light up green. And then it goes through the wall one more time to this long strip of LEDs, which are going to go up behind this beam so that they're hidden. And because this is the end of the lights, this is where that power is going to loop around and go back down the ground since it's the very end. So that was all of line one. Line two is this single LED that's sticking behind this door and the hole is way too small. So I am going to have to be enlargening this uh, so that all of the light can come through this red area of the door to make it nice and bright. My mission for today is to get all of these lights installed and well hidden and I'm going to start in the sandworm area because this is closest to the area where the lights came in through the wall. I'm using a mixture of hot glue and tacky glue to put these in place and then for the wires when I want them up out of the way I'm using masking tape and hot glue. I'm only using hot glue on the edges of the masking tape and not on the wires. That way if I do have to remove a light later down the road I can undo the masking tape and then just really worry about getting the light off and not the wires. To stick down these long pieces of LED strips, I'm going to be using some Fabrifix glue because using hot glue, it would just dry way too fast because these pieces are so long. This means I'm going to have to hold it in place a little bit more, but I do find that Fabrifix takes hold a little bit faster than tacky glue. I'm doing the same trick that I did earlier with a wood block so that I can make sure that these lights are facing down once they're behind this door. There is a little ghost that I sculpted to go behind this door, so I need to make sure that the lights are shining down on top of the ghost, and then I need to make sure that the door still fits once the lights are installed. Finally, once that's done, I can move on to the last strip of LEDs and get that glued onto the back of the back beam. Now that those are all out of the way, I can work on this uh, horrible project, which is going to be cutting this back wall even bigger. And this back wall is made of pure plywood. This made me so nervous because I had already worked so hard to get a really good finish on this hallway. And if I had one slip up, I could take out an entire column or mess up the floor. But I did come up with a process. I realized after using that little saw tool that I couldn't turn it. I could just go straight and it was taking forever. So I decided to use my Dremel to basically do a connect the dot type thing around the areas that I really wanted to cut out. And then I realized I couldn't push it with my hand enough to pop the wood out. So I got a really long dowel that fit down the hallway and a mallet and I started banging away until that little piece of wood came out. I did this same process for the entire hole and then tried to even it up a little bit with a long sanding stick. Finally, I felt like I had cut out enough so that I could light up the back of this door, which I think gives it so much more interest. And then I could use an LED mounted to a stick like I did before to have the light above the door. Now that all the lights are in, I can finally finish up all the little projects that are left in the hallway. I also need to program, well, Mr. Technology needs to program the lights so that they are the correct color and move like I want them to within the scene. Don't quite understand that part yet, but that's something I hope to learn. One of the things I had left unfinished was this side wall that's behind the wall that holds all of the doors. I wasn't really sure what the lighting was going to look like, what area I was going to need for wiring, so I left this open for easy access. Now that I don't need it, I know I need to fill it in. And the easiest way I felt like I could get a smooth transition from the side of the plywood area to the cardboard wall was to fill it with foam and then start to carve away. I had never tried this before, but honestly, I think it worked pretty well. 
Once I was happy with the general shape I was getting with the foam, I could take some drywall compound and start to fill in the holes and let it dry. I probably did this about three times until I was happy with the smoothness of the drywall compound. While that was drying, I decided to move my attention to the sandworm cell. Because I have a light that's directly on the ceiling, I needed to hide it. So I'm using the same method I used for the floor. I will link that video down below if you want to see it. But basically, I'm building up foil, some paper clay, and then I'm going to be painting it to try to match the original colors that I have. So it does look like it's a cell that's kind of carved out of some stone. Off camera, I painted the drywall compound black once it had dried, and then I decided I wanted a little bit more of a smoother transition from the black drywall over to the wall, so I just used some shaved chalk pastel in black to kind of make it a little bit fuzzy where those two meet. Now that the lights are in and the walls are complete, I can go ahead and put the doors in place. They have not been glued in and I've been trying not to lose or mess them up for quite a while. I did realize that the doors don't sit quite flush against the wall, which you wouldn't really be able to tell to the naked eye. However, when there's light shining back there for the Lost Souls door, there is some light pollution that comes through the edge. So I took some black cardstock and went all the way around the edge. So once the door's in place, no light can seep around the edges. The only doors that are supposed to have light behind them are the Lost Souls door and the light at the end of the hallway is supposed to have like red behind it. After all that work, it's finally time to play with the lights. They were somewhat programmed uh, just based off what I told my husband I wanted, but there were still a few adjustments like the sandworm having a party in the cell. And of course, Stormy was standing nearby to be helpful or distracting. I'm pretty sure her goal is distraction. But back to the lights, we got them working. There's a white light behind the back door, which is lighting up the red curtains. And then there is a light that's slightly moving behind the Lost Souls door, which is green. And I'm hoping it makes the look like the ghost is moving a little bit. Also, I wanted the same effect in the sandworm pit. I wanted it to be subtle and really you can tell more that it's happening in the shadows. It looks like the shadows are moving and this is because the lights are going around in a circle above the sandworm. I don't know if it looks like the sandworm is moving, but we're still playing around with it. So that's it for the lights for the waiting room and for the hallway. I'm happy with the results for both of them. And it is really wild to me to see both of them complete and in such close proximity to each other because they're both so classically Beetlejuice. I just, I'm over the moon with this process and I can't wait to do more. Before we end the video, I want to make sure and say thank you to two people who have sent in houses for the Beetlejuice diorama. I'm having so much fun showing off these little treasures in different parts of the Beetlejuice house. I think it makes it so much fun. And also thank you for the extras you both sent in. So that's all I have for you today. I had so much fun on this waiting room adventure. I just kind of randomly decided that I wanted to make the waiting room because I knew I would need it for the upcoming Beetle Gust or August later this year when I plan to make all the inhabitants for the underworld. On the screen, I'm going to put the ones I plan to make at the moment. This doesn't mean this is the final list. These are just the ones I plan to make in Beetle Gust. Let me know which one you're excited for the most. And maybe if I see a few certain names start to pop up, then maybe those would be first. We shall see. Thank you for watching the video. Make sure to leave a like if you've enjoyed this waiting room series. I've really enjoyed it, so I hope you have too. And likes always help my videos out so that I know you're enjoying it. I hope you all have an amazing week, and I will see you in the next one. Bye. I think we did it. I'm just wondering if anyone noticed that my YouTube plaque was missing in the last video. Modeling.